Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to a conversation on voter integrity. Joining me in the conversation is Dr. Edward Lynch, the John P. Wheeler Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Department of Global Politics and Society at Hollins University. Ed is also serves as the political analyst for WSLS News Channel 10. Ed, thanks so much for being with me, my colleague. I appreciate that. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Well, you know, the term voter integrity, it seems like it's become kind of a code word in a lot of ways. It seems like for Democrats, it's voter suppression. For Republicans, voter in, voting integrity is about trying to prevent fraud. And so it seems to me that now it has become such a political term. It really has. Uh, uh, you would not think that uh, a proposition like votes that are cast should be cast legally by legal voters who have a legal right to vote. Uh, that has become controversial uh, because of the definition, various definitions of the word legal in that sentence. What is a legal vote? Who is a legal voter? What should you have to do uh, in order to be a legal voter? Uh, uh, how much effort should be involved in voting? All of these uh, are, are perennial questions. I mean, look, charges of voter fraud are nothing new in this country. Uh, as, as I sometimes tell audiences, the United States faces a situation in which a defeated presidential candidate is making incessant charges of fraud, harping on the last election and promising to run again. I'm referring, of course, to Andrew Jackson's reaction to his defeat by John Quincy Adams in 1824. So there's nothing new about this. But the, uh, the politicization of it, uh, particularly since 2016 and then increasing after the 2020 election, uh, uh, that, that has uh, added to the sort of corrosive nature of political discourse in this country. Absolutely. And of course, I hope that what we'll do in the next few minutes is explore some of the dimensions uh, in terms of voting integrity. But I guess the first basic question, uh, should we be concerned? Are there genuine concerns? in terms of voting integrity in contemporary times? Well, I think there have to be. Uh, and, f and I would say that, I, I say that for two reasons. Number one, we have a much, much more sharply divided electorate. You know, there are elections certainly in our lifetime and in the lifetime of, of many of the people watching where the stakes did not seem quite so high and it didn't seem like so many people looked at it as a matter of life and death that their candidate win the election uh, you know with uh, uh, with, with uh, Bob Dole and and Bill Clinton for example most people could probably agree well we're not going to go too far wrong with either one of those uh, uh, and at the same time the second reason we need to be concerned about it is that uh, elections are so frequently so close you know, since, uh, since World War II, we've only had about four or five elections where we even had to stay up late in order to find out who won the election. Uh, you know, uh, Clinton and Dole, that was over in August. Uh, uh, Reagan and Mondale, that was over in August. Uh, and yet, three out of the three, three elections in about the last 20 years, 2000, 2016, and 2020, We've either had to stay up late or it's been days uh, in the case of 2020 weeks before we knew the winner. Uh, and when the elections are that close, then even relatively minor charges of fraud can be perceived to have changed the outcome of the election. And that's why this is so serious. And there's always, as we know, uh, fraud. What's interesting, the National Association of Secretaries of State and their summer conference, about a dozen of them said that there was some real genuine concerns of fraud, and this came from places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, mm. Ohio, Georgia, Nevada, Wisconsin. <clears throat> um, and so indeed, there seems to be this legitimate thing to think about, and it revolves around the notion of security. We want to make sure that our vote is secure, is one of those. But I find it ironic that the more states perhaps try to make it secure, making sure that there can be no fraud, no way to misrepresent a vote, people would say, well, then, then you are suppressing vote. There'll be, you're eliminating people's votes. But on the other hand, the more you try to say exception, exception, we'll try this and try to increase voter turnout, then it makes elections perhaps more vulnerable and less secure. That's an interesting kind of ironic intention mm. in terms of security and voting. Well, you know, I remember during the 2000 election 
controversy which went on for weeks. I remember very vividly then Vice President Al Gore talking about the importance of counting every vote in Florida, which was the, the swing state in that particular election. And he said something that's always stuck with me. He said, a vote is not just a vote, it is a human voice. And where I think politicians, state legislators and others have to be headed in this discussion as they talk about this is making sure that one vote represents one voice. Uh, that uh, one vote represents one person, that this voice cast in for Republican, for a Democrat, for a third party, belongs to the person whom that vote evidently or supposedly belongs to. That's really what this is all about, to make sure that we match up votes with people. And it really is a kind of a, kind of a balance. You know, for me, this notion of voting integrity is kind of on a continuum. On a scale of one to 10, the 10 being the most secure that it possibly could be would be I show up, I have my ID, they verify that I who is voting is supposed to vote at that location, you see me vote it, and then can trust it in terms of being confidential, transparent, and counted, to when we start having other things going to, oh, I don't know, and we'll talk about some of these in just a few minutes, maybe ballot harvesting or, or even voter ID, the more we go, then the less confidence or perceptions one might have. I will confess myself, in some states, uh, I might would have a confidence of maybe only a six or a seven, mm. depending upon how and the process in terms of voting. So for me, it's kind of a, of a continuum. But yet, we do know, before we get to some of the, uh, of the measures, it's essential for people to believe that the vote counts and there's not fraud. That's important, a foundation of democracy. Absolutely, and there are two places where that con those concerns are most frequently and most appropriately uh, expressed. One is the one that we've touched on, uh, which is matching up a particular vote with a particular voice, with a particular person, making sure that when I go to the polling place and identify myself as Edward Lynch, that Edward Lynch, Ed Lynch's name is crossed off the list, that nobody else calling himself Edward Lynch can vote. You know, votes, integrity when the votes are cast. And then, of course, the other issue is the counting. Uh, you know, Joseph Stalin famously said, it doesn't matter who casts the votes, it only matters who counts the votes. <laughs> and in both of those areas, there has to be uh, the perception of fairness and the perception of reality. You know, I, I do understand, and, and uh, as we look at this broader issue, so we were in the age of, obviously, or the time of COVID, and I understand during the election that they wanted to try to make sure there was access in terms of voting. But I guess what got me and some of the things of trying to encourage that from the very get-go was the notion of, well, wait a minute, who makes election laws? Is it this legislature? Can election officials just say all of a sudden, um, no, you can have drop boxes and we will dictate rather than it going through the legislature? And I guess trying to, for example, just now, this many years later, Wisconsin Supreme Court said regulators had no legal authority to allow voters to cast ballots in mobile drop boxes. Not saying that it would change the outcome because the votes that were there in the drop box are properly counted are mm -hmm. fine. But the fact of the matter is they were not the legislature and did not have the right for that particular type of balloting. And so there's always irregularities, but it is go back to the continuum. And then of course, it seems like COVID as states tried to deal with that, increased some of the risk and problems. I think one of the, I think probably the basic problem in places like Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania was, was another uh, where uh, the legislators brought multiple lawsuits uh, alleging that the governor and um, executive office, executive branch officials were changing election law and bypassing the legislature. What much of that activity was based on was the proposition that the legislature couldn't meet or could not act rapidly enough. And there's no evidence for that. Uh, look, starting w in March of 2020, we all, by necessity, got used to Zoom meetings. Uh, there's no reason to believe that state legislators were any less skilled at doing a Zoom meeting than anyone else. Uh, they certainly could have acted. There certainly could have been debate. Uh, 
legislatures have proven over and over that when the times call for it, they can actually act very quickly and very um, uh, expeditiously. Uh, there, and, and perhaps that would not have happened, but the point is we'll never know because in states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, uh, the, the executive branch officials didn't even try. And when we start looking at some of the practices, um, cybersecurity is a particular issue, not only in terms of the voting and, and processing of votes, but I guess the notion of in-person voting, that's probably the most straightforward. Um, but then you got to be conscious of those with disabilities and accommodations. But when it comes to voter ID, that seems to be so controversial in and of itself. I know I'm a generational. <laughs> Uh, individual, but it's hard for me to believe that an ID is overly burdensome, whether it's your gas bill or your electric bill or what have you. How important is voter ID? That seems to be one of the controversial easy ones that we see. I think that uh, voter identification is very important, but there are ways in which legislatures and other decision makers can make that easier for people. For one thing, they can expand the sorts of identification that are valid. Uh, in South Carolina, for example, uh, they, the legislature started, this is some years before 2020, uh, requiring driver's licenses. Well, immediately, of course, the objection was raised. What about people who don't drive or, or can't afford a car and never got a, a driver's license? So the state began issuing simply a individual identification. Uh, but there are other ways you can get to that uh, in, uh, in, in the days before driver's licenses, for example, a century ago, uh, if you could produce a letter that was addressed to you at your address, that would be sufficient for identification. So pay, uh, your rent bill, your mortgage, uh, your phone bill, things like this, uh, these could at least conceivably be used as identification, but the voter would have to make some effort to convince the people on the other side of the table that yes, I am Edward Lynch and I am in this precinct and I am here to vote. Um, Nikki Haley from South Carolina, she was governor at the time, said uh, the, uh, the notion that uh, minorities are worse at getting an identification or can't get an identity card, and she of course is a person of color herself, uh, she said that's flagrantly racist. You know, a lot of the mail in voting. What I didn't realize, I probably should have, but again, like everything, states are different. Mm -hmm. So to mail it in or to receive a ballot, well, just to mail it in, does it need proper signature verifications? All the things around that. So you think on the front of it, it wouldn't be a particular problem, but even that is not as easy as one thinks or, or not complicated in itself. Well, those sorts of documents, uh, and I've done absentee uh, voting uh, and uh, had the, uh, I had a real thrill back in 2016. I was teaching a class that was made up entirely of freshmen and they were all new to to college, most of them had just turned 18, and most of them were voting in their first election. So this, and this was the election between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. So I had the, uh, the actually very thrilling uh, uh, option to verify a student's signature on her, uh, on her absentee ballot. She asked me to do that. Uh, uh, but looking at that and having voted absentee myself, those documents can be intimidating. Uh, they're, they're filled with legalese, the print can be kind of small, uh, so I could certainly understand why there might be some hesitation. On the other hand, it's not out of the question for states and localities to provide some assistance uh, in convenient places at convenient times for people who, who need to fill out these forms. They can certainly be filled out online, uh, which is done with some frequency. So. Uh, I don't see that as being an un insurmountable barrier to creating the sort of confidence in the perception that we've been talking about, that there is uh, a, a matchup between the votes that are cast and the persons who are casting them. You know, in the, in the number about mm -hmm. drop boxes, where mm -hmm. um, you just drive up like a mailbox and put it in, uh, it, are they supervised? Is it monitored? Uh, can that be abused? I guess it's on the counting end where it might be more responsibility. But the number and <coughs> locations of drop boxes now seems to be another kind of controversial area in terms of suppression or to prevent fraud. Your thoughts on that? I think drop boxes are extremely problematical. Uh, they're, they aren't supervised. Uh, the, um, 
the possibility of somebody uh, uh, harvesting ballots, as they say, and there are instances where people were going into nursing homes and, and lo and behold, they had 100% voter uh, participation, uh, which is something that very few random groups of people ever achieve, uh, and, and then dropping them into a box, even if there isn't outright fraud, drop boxes have become sort of an all, a symbol for those who are concerned about voter integrity, Republicans and conservatives for the most part, a symbol of the opportunity and a seemingly limitless opportunity for voter fraud. So I, I think that uh, uh, I, of all of the changes that were made in 2020, that's the one I have the most difficulty with. Well, the whole notion of ballot harvesting was problematic, again, for me. Because when people go in to collect the ballots, these tend to be organizations that have partisan or particular um, single issue kind of views that mm -hmm. they're dealing with. And as you say, it was in Wisconsin where some nursing homes had 100% participation. And you gather them and then you go and, and deliver. That to me is on the scale when I was talking about the continuum of one to 10, boy, that really for me gets it way down, that hurly, um, in terms of that notion of trust. Well, what? I think, if I may, yeah, I please. think appropriately so, because uh, if you talk to a defense attorney or you talk to a group of defense attorneys, attorneys who specialize in criminal defense, one of the ways in which they do what their job is, and their job is to create some doubt in the minds of, of a juror that this person is guilty of a crime, one of the most frequently way, frequent ways in which they'll do that is by examining what's called chain of custody of evidence. So if evidence is gathered at a crime scene, where does it go? Who had it? Who had this evidence? Where did it go from there? Who's been looking after it? Was it did anybody else see it? Was there, uh, um, uh, was, were there protections uh, against tampering with that evidence? And that's the problem with drop boxes is we don't have that chain of custody. If person A picks up the ballots from the, from the drop box and it's five or 10 miles from there to wherever the ballots are counted, all sorts of things can happen uh, during that transition if it's not supervised, if there isn't some sort of oversight of what's going on there. You know, the notion of early voting um, and, and having well extended times, I, I, I guess I'm a, such a campaigns person because that impacts the strategy. You don't hear the arguments, the persuasion, the debates perhaps and what have you. And so while there should be early voting, longer opportunities of voting, my goodness, it shouldn't be for months necessarily. And so how do you kind of think about in terms of early voting, should there be a limit to that? I think there needs to be a limit to that uh, because again, not all the issues in a campaign will come up all at the same time. Uh, we've had any number of campaigns where there have been last minute revelations, uh, not necessarily an October surprise where it's planned, but something happens that's out of the control of either candidate, but will affect voters' perception. The other problem with, with early voting, particularly if those absentee or early votes are counted before election day, is the possibility that those partial results will be leaked uh, to one of the candidates perhaps. Let's say there's an election official who is sympathetic to a candidate who's running for office uh, and uh, wants to let her know, you know, hey, you're, you're behind here. You need to do more campaigning in the northern part of your district. Uh, that really is an interference in the election process. Uh, and some of the more recent laws that have been passed by state legislatures uh, specifically address that by saying you can have extended voting, but no votes can be counted until votes are, uh, the polls are closed on election day. And see, that's another one of the interesting things. In other words, when are votes counted and high? Digital electronic mm -hmm. first. Um, or go ahead and do the provisional, or go ahead and do the um, early voting, but yet that may end up taking a week before the results. And when we go to bed and we really don't know the results, doesn't that kind of subconsciously, like day two, day three, there's these legal challenges, and that kind of starts eroding that kind of trust. Like, well, what's going on? One, two, three, four, counting shouldn't be that difficult. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I 
have been an election official uh, or an election observer, excuse me, not an election official, from time to time. And uh, this is when the you know, voting machines were being used and people would cluster around. They'd open the back of the machine. There's a seal on it. You can see the numbers there. You write them down and you report them to the county seat, wherever that happens to be. No, it's, it shouldn't be that complicated a process. And yet it's very easy to imagine a situation in which either a, a media outlet or an election official will think, well, I want to create an impression here. So these votes are likely to favor my candidate. I'll report those first uh, and then we'll get to the other votes. So, you know, we'll make it closer a little bit later on. And of course, the classic and uh, my, my original area of political expertise is developing nations. Mm -hmm. And one part of that development is towards democracy in many cases. So learning how to run an election and there are more cases than I can count in which there is an election in a developing country and suddenly the counting just simply stops and there's dead air for three or four hours and when it resumes again lo and behold the government candidate is now ahead uh, we hope not to see that in the United States but with uh, within uncertainties about the process of counting it makes it more possible you know in Virginia, both of us as analysts, um, we know that we have to wait till those Northern Virginia votes come in and it's going to change. And part of what our jobs, what we do is, is don't get too excited. Southwest, Southwest Virginia, we know how they're going to lean in all of that. And it does become somewhat problematic because it can absolutely flip. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it seems, quote, strange. We have about four minutes or so remaining. Do you think we need, is it time now to have national standards? Can, is, is it just too much variation state by state, or do you think it is reasonable to, whether it's weekend voting or whatever, should, should we have national standards? Uh, national standards tend to make me nervous. This is a very large, very diverse country. What works in West Virginia may not work in Wyoming. Uh, what works in California may not work in Rhode Island. Uh, so. I think if there are to be national standards, they need to be minimalist. Uh, certain very, very few things should be restricted. Very, very few things should be uh, promoted on a national level. Moreover, I'm not sure that national standards for elections would even be constitutional. Uh, the Constitution really empowers the state legislatures and state governments uh, when it comes to elections, including national elections. Uh, the Supreme Court will be hearing a case this coming term on the role of state legislatures, uh, which could empower them even more. So uh, national standards uh, are a problem, but, uh, and, and of course, if you get something wrong, then it's wrong for the entire country. Uh, if a state gets something right, other states can copy it. That's, that's absolutely true. And, and so, and we didn't really have time to talk about the social media because it plays a role from the standpoint of conspiracy. Sure. And so while we look at these processes, it does seem to be a correlation, not only in terms of COVID, concerns about suppression, but then also the social media can just create doubt in just a nanosecond. It can, and it can go so much faster than it could in the days before social media. Uh, we had a situation in this country in which uh, there was a contested election and the results were not known for weeks and the eventual winner was known throughout his presidency as his fraudulency. That was <laughs> President Rutherford B. Hayes who was elected in 1876. And across the, the, the uh, suspicions crossed the country almost as quickly as they do now. Oh my goodness. Well, in the remaining moments we have, what's the bottom line in terms of voter integrity? For me, it seems it's a legitimate topic for consideration. It shouldn't necessarily be politicized. It seems to be two sides, whether it's liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republicans have it, but it's certainly something of genuine consideration. Your final thoughts on that? My final thoughts are that this is a classic case for American federalism to play a role. As I mentioned a moment ago, state legislators, legislators all over the country are wrestling with this. They're coming up with different solutions. I think they'll show us which ones work well and which ones work not so well. Where can you find, if the balance is going to be struck between voter integrity and no voter suppression, 
uh, it is more likely to be found through a lot of experimentation in 50 different states than it is with a smaller group of people trying to come up with a single standard for this country of ours. And you think we can do that by 2024? Yes. I do. Uh, legislators, uh, again, can move very quickly when they're highly motivated. Uh, I've seen it in Richmond. You have see, you've seen it in Richmond. I grew up outside uh, Philadelphia. I saw it in Harrisburg as well. So, yes, uh, legislatures are known for being very slow and deliberate, but they're not always slow and deliberate. Well, Ed, my friend, thank you so much for joining the conversation. And that's all the time we have, and I certainly thank my guests, and I thank you for joining us, and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.